In the autumn of 1963, a group of executives at Rothmans of Pall Mall were debating the possibility of providing something unique in cricket for the summer of 1965, the 75th anniversary of the company. An idea was mooted which, after two years of careful organisation, was to grow into the first England v the rest of the world match ever to be staged. During the intervening two years, however, Rothmans, whose aim is to support cricket at all levels, continued and expanded their other activities in the sport. In conjunction with MCC, fixture lists were designed, printed and supplied to clubs and organisations throughout the country. As in previous years, over one million almanacs were printed. They contained articles, biographical notes, photographs and statistics to mark each test series. The Australian tourists in 1964 and the New Zealanders and South Africans in 1965 were once again provided with their touring necessity, a baggage wagon, each specially painted in the colours of the touring side and bearing its crest. Films of the tests were made to be shown to cricket lovers during the winter months and in the summer of 1964, Ted Dexter's book of test matches was published to be followed a year later by John Arlott's History of Cricket. The first editions were sold out within weeks. On the field, the series of Rothman's Cavaliers matches on behalf of beneficiaries were continued. Match souvenirs were produced and at the matches themselves, famous cricketers were drawn together to be seen in friendly surroundings by an ever-widening audience. In 1965, that audience was extended considerably when, through BBC Two, the games, described by famous guest cricket commentators, were televised in full to millions of homes. Prior to that, in September 1964, the West Indies touring team were brought over for a short three-match tour. In addition, a new knockout competition was initiated with the Northern League Conference, which proved to be an immediate success with Northern cricket lovers. And all the time, preparations for bringing together the greatest cricketers in the world were going steadily forward. It was decided early on that the only satisfactory way of choosing the team was by public vote. And agreement was reached with BBC Sportsview and the Radio Times to run a series of coupons allowing viewers to pick the team of their choice. Full pages in the Radio Times were allocated and the coupon was reinforced by a direct television appeal to sports viewers. The response was almost overwhelming and after weeks of sifting and sorting in the BBC mailroom, cricket devotees from all over the country had made their choice. A choice which gave the organisers their supreme challenge the sheer physical problem of contacting cricketers, many of whom were constantly on the move and bringing them together from all over the globe. Despite the problems, however, the team was assembled in England by September the 5th and every schoolboy's dream had come true. With their World Eleven Blazers, the 12 finest cricketers from the rest of the world were ready to mount their five-nation invasion of England. A five-nation invasion of England. This venture, the mustering of a World Eleven to play together, was the best idea in terms of cricket promotion since Spires and Ponds sent that first bold, bewhiskered English team to Australia over a hundred years ago. And it was the first deliberate collection of all the best players in the world since William Clark's All England Eleven of the 1840s, before the rest of the world mattered. Two Australians, Bobby Simpson and O'Neill, of the original selections, withdrew. But there was very little loss of cricketing ability when Barlow, the busy South African opener, came in and the Nawab of Pataudi, captain of India, completed the 12. The unquestionable friendship between Pataudi and Hanif, captain of Pakistan, was movingly significant at a time when India and Pakistan were at war. It was a team for superlatives. From all the test-playing countries except, of course, England, it was captained by John Reid of New Zealand, test batsman, bowler, wicketkeeper, fieldsman, and the senior test captain. He had under him Garfield Sobers, unquestionably the finest all-rounder in the world, Conrad Hunt, fluent and sound opening bat, Lance Gibbs of the vicious offspin and countless variations on it, Rowan Canhai, the most exotic stroke maker in modern test cricket, Colin Bland, the greatest outfield in cricket history. 
Wesley Hall, the fastest bowler now playing, and his partner, Charlie Griffith, of the deadly Yorker and Bouncer, and the action that has roused controversy and feeling. Wally Grout, holder of the wicket-keeping record of eight catches in a single innings. Their opponents, two strong England sides. They began at Scarborough, picturesque with its two different towns in one, set beside their two bays, and separated by the great rock, crowned with its ruined castle. The convivial home of the one indestructible cricket festival, now nearly a hundred years old, with its constant crowds, content to endure even the lashing wind and threatening rain of the world team's visit. Eddie Barlow and Conrad Hunt, though kept apart in test cricket by politics, appreciated one another's company off the field as well as on. They opened together against White and Rumsey. There was skill in the batting, and from time to time great strokes, but the first day went to the England bowlers, refusing to be overawed and making the most of the fact that they were acclimatised to the English summer. Kanhai played one stroke, a cover drive off Rumsey, that was worth going many a mile to see. Colin Bland batted responsibly for all his relaxed air, and every now and again his bat flowed through a long, loose, free arc and the ball flew. But Fred Rumsey at pace, Fred Titmus with flight and a little spin, and Barry Knight, moving the ball off the seam, nibbled their way through. Bob Barber came on for a longer spell than leg spinners are usually given nowadays, and he served his side handsomely. Bland came to his 50 and was then out to Barber. That brought Hall into Griffith. Hall feeling that he, as the senior batsman of the two, might have gone in earlier. It was a cricketing certainty that they wouldn't stay long together. And they didn't. But England had done well to put out so great a batting list for little over 200. A start to the England innings and then festival match or no, the light was simply not good enough for any batsman to face Griffiths with no sight screen behind him. The second day was England's too, though the pitch was the first hero for recovering so well from the night's rain, and the crowd earned a mention, for it was another day of knifing wind. John Edrich struggled at first, not merely against Hall and Griffith, but against the psychological effect of the blow he'd received in the Lord's Test. But after Barber was out, he gradually settled in with Parfit. To some, the most important matter of the day was the scrutiny of Charlie Griffith's bowling action by the man usually regarded as the sternest of English umpires, Sid Buller, who looked at him first from square leg. Then, for a couple more overs, he shifted to point. The ground buzzed. Does Griffith throw? What does a slow motion film show? We took this one of him. Does it help you to make up your mind? One thing is certain. Watch it again. Certainly, you'll never see a bowling arm move over faster in slow motion. As Edrich found his feet, he began to hit the ball hard, and three times he struck Lance Gibbs for prodigious distances. Peter Parfit, too, survived from anxiety to assurance. In fact, to handsome, poised aggression. Here's the essence of this match. The arc of the field from wicketkeeper to gully. Australian Grout, Pakistani Hanif, West Indian Sobers, South African Barlow, New Zealander Reed.
half it batted with Ken Barrington until the gale eventually brought rain beyond argument or hope for the day. Hunt and Barlow, West Indian and South African, again began the third day's batting together when Smith, in an attempt to make up for the lost time, closed the England innings still 55 behind. As different as, shall we say, chop from cheese in approach and method, they dovetailed like old partners, or as the mutually respecting friends they'd become. And, shrewdly, taking no risks but missing no chance to score, they made, historically speaking, a unique hundred for the first wicket, and at a run a minute. Hanif batted as ever, with that air of being bigger than he is. But Parfit, a better bowler than's always allowed, nipped in with two quick and impressive wickets. <laughs> then the runs ticked up steadily, until, reckoning on an easily paced wicket taking a little turn, John Reed declared and set England 209 to win in 160 minutes. It could have been a tough finish, but instead it was a wet one. There could be only one result to the captain's inspection, match abandoned. And only one when they did the same thing the next morning at Lord's. No play until Monday. And even then, after yet more rain, not until three in the afternoon, with England put in for a single innings knockout match, 70 overs aside. Half the game lost. And if the players had been of lesser caliber, most of the pleasure lost too. But here were delights on the highest level of cricket. Hall bowling, one of the most stirring sights the game has ever seen. Majestic power and speed. Look at it again now in slow motion, the poetry of motion. Patowdy taking the place of Barlow, fielding in the covers. Bland, too, of course, moving with that rationalized speed and magic of his. Though, comfortingly for lesser beings, even he can nod. Gibbs, spinning the ball savagely, if not always luckily. Wally Grout, although it was for him a case of out of season, had shown himself good enough to take this utterly strange bowling completely competently until he split a fingernail. Out of three more men in the side who'd kept wicket in tests, it was Hanif who took over until tea and took a catch. The twelfth man, Derek Murray, holder of the West Indian test wicket keeping record, kept afterwards. But the successes were by no means all on the world side. Eric Russell batted with a stylish serenity that argues the class player. Bob Barber put wrists and weight into his strokes. He was going headlong when Gibbs, who bowls the harder in face of punishment, beat him through the air. Two more quick wickets. A hard catch made to look easy by Reid's experience. And England were 1-4-8 for four, made up 3.7 and over at the end of the day. That seemed good enough when the last day began, but that morning belonged to Sobers, and to a lesser but not less spectacular degree to Wesley Hall. The remaining six wickets went down for only another 27 runs. wanted 176 to win and, disheartening prospect for bowlers and fieldsmen, 
Conrad Hunt and Hanif Mohammed to start to make them. Nostalgically, the bowling was opened by Brian Statham, most unrelenting of fast bowlers, best of men. And unlucky as ever, Hanif dropped off his first ball. England were never again in with a chance. Hanif went his smooth, unhurried way, while Hunt, giving no hint that he hadn't played a match for months until these two, played them all with firm mastery. Statham. <laughs> David Larter proving himself fit for Australia after injury. The steady Tom Cartwright. David Allen with his sharp off spin. And it was Allen who delighted himself by taking Hanif's wicket. But then came the Nawab of Pataudi. How can a man bat like that after his accident with less than one and a half efficient eyes? <laughs> then it was all over. The world by nine wickets. And not even the rain could prevent it from being a memorable week. Historically, the five test-playing countries brought their cricket back to the place where it began. And that piece of history, run by run, picture by picture, has been recorded and lodged at Lord's. For those of us who watched, we saw the masters in action. We knew these two games would make cricket history, we hadn't foreseen with such certainty that they would be humanly historic as well. This is not high-flown sentimental claptrap. We saw cricketers play their way through the barriers of politics and even war as if they didn't exist. And that was the real success of these matches. <laughs>